This is CBC Here and Now. Tonight, a mill shut down on the West Coast. Cornerbrook Pulp and Paper plans to halt production and lay off employees. And 30 years later, a somber vigil at Memorial University is about to start to remember the victims of the Montreal Massacre on December 6th, 1989. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. We're going to start tonight on the West Coast where workers at Cornerbrook Pulp and Paper are bracing themselves for a Christmas closure. Cornerbrook Pulp and Paper has announced that it is restructuring staff to keep its labor costs in line. And that is going to mean a loss of permanent status for some workers at Newfoundland and Labrador's only newsprint mill. In a statement, the Kruger owned mill said it will also halt production on Christmas Eve for about two weeks, and that's going to affect 365 employees. Production will resume on January 6th. Now, the company says depending on market conditions, there could be more downtime over the winter months. The company says 22 employees will be affected by these changes. They'll essentially lose their full time jobs and join the casual pool. But the company insists they'll still get full time hours by being part of the casual pool at the mill. Well, the mayor of Cornerbrook has a message tonight for employees of the mill and people who live in the city. Don't panic feel for the, uh, the people affected uh, over the Christmas break. I would imagine that is somewhat uh, part of the, uh, you know, their strategy is to uh, take that time when it uh, might be most convenient from a uh, holidays and that kind of perspective. But as far as I can tell that this is a temporary problem, we dealt with 32% tariffs not that long ago from the U.S., and we came out the other side even stronger. There's a lot going on with the mill, and the parent company is continuing to invest tens of millions of dollars in this operation. So I would say the long term is very bright. And now to a tragic anniversary in our country. 30 years ago today, a gunman entered École Polytechnique and Engineering School in Montreal and separated the women from the men. He then shouted that he hated feminists before opening fire. 14 women were killed. Many more were injured, and most of the women were studying to become engineers. Here now's Katie Breen is at a vigil remembering the tragedy. A service is held every year at Memorial University's engineering building in St. John's. Katie. That's right, the vigil is about to get underway. They just actually, they're closing the doors now to begin. Every year there's a procession. People, candles, they read out the names of the 14 victims. You're hearing the music now. It's a space for people to remember an attack that targeted women who were trying to enter a male-dominated field, a time to reflect on gender inequality in engineering and the world, how it's changed in the last 30 years and how it hasn't. Memorial University, 30 years ago. Eileen O'Brien was studying engineering, just like many of the victims at Ecole Polytechnique. Conversations with classmates, she said, turned to that classroom. What if they had been there with that gunman? What would they have done? It was impossible to keep from drawing parallels. There was confusion at the time about the shooter's motive. His suicide note was filled with hatred towards women, but still people wondered if it was a gendered attack. It was difficult even for O'Brien to comprehend. I think I knew it, but I don't know that I saw it. I think it took a few years of being in, I guess, the working world and seeing that the inequality was still there, that uh, it really came home to me. In retrospect, she says people who've reflected on the attacks have come to recognize it for what it was, violence against women. I think it was a wake-up call. I think people started to realize that um, there were differences between the way women and men were being treated. And there were differences in the industry. There was differences um, in the world. Yeah, it, I definitely felt outnumbered. Samantha Ellis is close to 30, almost as old as the attack itself. She didn't live through it, but still, as an engineer, it weighs on her. There are unfortunately still some people that view women as inferior in engineering. It's getting better, she says. More women like her and O'Brien who are math and science oriented, are enrolling, becoming engineers, and moving up the ladder. Even in her five years in the industry, Ellis says she's noticed a shift, a change in mentality, gender becoming less of a consideration. 
I hope and I think that we'll get to the point someday that it's irrelevant. You're seeing the procession inside now, and O'Brien is actually looking on. Back in 1989, she wrote a poem after the massacre to understand her feelings about the attack. She actually posted it here, inside the engineering building. One of her classmates was so moved by it, in fact, he actually kept a copy. Recently, he returned it to her, and tonight, she's going to read that poem for the first time in front of the crowd. Live in St. John's, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. Well, to the legislature now and what was a long day and night of debating that ended with an apology from Christopher Mitchellmore. And it was one that the Liberal cabinet minister did not give willingly. It came only after four days of debate and finally a vote by MHAs that forced him to stand up in the House of Assembly and accept responsibility for his actions in the Carla Foote hiring controversy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and as the member for St. Barb Lansing Meadows, I unequivocally apologize to the House of Assembly and to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you. Along with the verbal apology, he'll have to write an apology to the Board of the Rooms. He'll be suspended for two weeks from the House of Assembly, this without pay, and that's the first time that the House has ever done that or voted to do that. And he'll have to meet with the Commissioner for Legislative Standards. But that's not the end of the controversy. Christopher Mitchellmore continues to dodge reporters. Here now is Peter Cowan first broke this story more than a year ago and has been following it closely ever since. So Peter, let's take a look at a few things that we still don't know. Why exactly was Carla Foote moved and, and whose idea was all this? Anthony, that is one of the key questions. We don't really know. Mitchell Moore isn't talking to us. The Premier insists that no one in his office directed her to be moved, but in her old job, she reported directly to him, and he can't remember when exactly he was brought in the loop on this move. The report didn't interview Foote or the Premier or many of his key staff, so the answer isn't there. This was likely, though, more about getting her out of her old job than putting her into a new one. Numerous sources in government have told me she was difficult to deal with. The Premier has been very vague about whose idea this was. The opposition has made it clear they think Mitchell Moore is just taking the blame for all of this. And here's a comment yesterday from the Premier about why, even after gross misconduct, Mitchell Moore is still in Cabinet. Well, Minister Mitchell Moore should stay in Cabinet. I mean, he's been, uh, he's been a pretty loyal soldier and he's been a hard worker. Now, soldiers are known for taking orders, and the opposition leader thinks that's exactly what happened. I think he's just going through the motions, frankly, if you want my opinion. Everyone in there in that house knows what happened. The Premier's chief of staff or other high official made a suggestion or gave a direction. It doesn't matter because when it comes from the Premier, a suggestion is a direction. Now, there are still a bunch of things that we don't know, along with whose idea this actually was. Did the person who was removed at the rooms to make room for Carla Foote get a payout? Now, the current minister is refusing to say, calling it an HR matter. One of the other questions, why not have a competition for the executive director job at the rooms? They can cancel Carla Foote's contract at any time, it's open-ended, and if she really was the most qualified, as the premier claims, then surely she'd get the job and put at least part of this controversy to bed. Now, some of these things are things that we could find out from Christopher Mitchell more, but as you can see, he's avoided talking to the media all week and left the House last night even before it finished without answering any questions. Anthony? Well, Christopher Mitchellmore almost escaped the House last night without any punishment. That part of the story is coming up later on Here and Now. In other news, there is another twist tonight in the strange story of a man acquitted of arson. David Badruden is a free man after a glaring oversight was revealed in court and the police chief is not happy about it. Here now is Ryan Cook explains. I met with the director of public prosecutions and I expressed my concern with what happened and I forwarded a, a complaint to him. Joe Boland has lodged a complaint about Chris McCarthy, the Crown prosecutor responsible for the case against accused arsonist David Badruden. That case fell to pieces when McCarthy didn't prove an essential element that Badruden owned the Waterford Manor. McCarthy laid it at the feet of lead investigator Steve Walsh, but Boland says there's a big problem with that. The problem that we have with what happened at trial was that the officer was never asked to present evidence on the ownership of that property. He's right. McCarthy never asked Walsh about ownership of the house. 
The Waterford Manor was about 115 years old when it was rocked by explosions and fire. Firefighters battled for more than 12 hours to save whatever they could, but in the end it was bulldozed. Walsh was hounded by defence lawyers about the lack of evidence he collected, but Boland says it's not his fault. His complaint lays the blame back at McCarthy's feet. Just on the, uh, the lack of uh, thoroughness on behalf of the, the prosecutor and how it got portrayed in the end, you know, just throwing up your hands and saying it is what it is or saying that the officer never brought forward evidence to establish, the, you know, who owned the property is not correct. We reached out to public prosecutions this afternoon and Director Ian Hollett said he's taking time to review the complaint. We still don't know if Bad Rudin could be charged again with a different type of arson, but Boland says it never should have gotten to this point. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. saw a few peaks of sun earlier today for most or for parts of the Avalon rather uh, we're seeing some showers along the west coast and uh, even some flurry activity and then same thing for parts of eastern Newfoundland and we can thank onshore flow for that we're starting to see that with those winds onshore along the west coast and it's going to pick up even more tonight. We're getting into a snow squall setup, so there is a snow squall watch in place for mainly areas around Gross Morn and then up through parts of the northern peninsula as well. Could pick up uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 centimeters of snow with that. And then as we head into the weekend, a little bit of a system moving through, at least some snow moving through up through portions of coastal Labrador with a winter storm warning in effect. I'll have all those details in your full weekend forecast coming up, Anthony. Thanks, Ashley. A Parsons Pond woman has been found not guilty of dangerous driving causing death. Neela Blanchard was charged after Justin Hines was killed in September of 2017. The 17-year-old was walking to school when Blanchard's SUV struck and killed him. In Supreme Court today, Judge Valerie Marshall brought down her decision and she said it was proven that Blanchard's driving killed Hines. However, the judge said it was not proven that Blanchard's actions were beyond what would be normal under the circumstances. Defense attorney Jim Bennett said his client carries a heavy burden of killing the teenager. No winners here today. Uh, there's no winners here. Uh, Neela Blanchard has this uh, chapter in her life behind her, but uh, she uh, still bears a heavy burden, which she has uh, borne uh, uh, mentally and psychologically for causing the death of, of that young man. A not-for-profit group is pushing to get more technology and science in the classroom to get more graduates interested in the tech sector. Brilliant Labs teaches students about coding and technology and in partnership with the province, they're already in 65% of the schools, including Vanier Elementary in St. John's and we swung by there earlier today. Hi, my name is Brian War. I'm the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. The children today, I mean, having, having such a watch, wonderful opportunity in, in schools and, and bringing uh, brilliant labs to the schools, uh, you know, giving them the opportunities uh, to engage in um, and, and focus on, on, on different aspects of, uh, of education outside of the regular classroom uh, activities. And, uh, you know, we're, we're so happy to be a part of it. Children are getting the opportunity to engage uh, in, like in, in these projects, in coding and uh, computational thinking. And it's, it's so important. I mean, the tech sector, uh, you know, it's going to be huge as these children, uh, you know, uh, grow throughout the educational system. And it just better, it better prepares them uh, for, for what's coming tomorrow. And it's all part of our, our educa education action plan and the Premier's task force on improving educational outcomes. And uh, this is what we're here to do, to celebrate this today. And uh, again, I'm so glad to be here to be a part of it. All right, well, staying with students, this time students of sport, some young first-timers laced up their skates this week to take to the ice, and they went into it blind, quite literally. The third annual hockey training camp is specifically for visually impaired children. Well, I've always liked to play hockey. It's like my favorite sport. But when in grade eight, uh, I was deemed legally blind. So I was given the opportunity to go away to a camp in Vancouver to go try the sport out. and. I loved it, so we, me and my dad started a program here. Uh, blind hockey is uh, it's pretty much, I mean, it's, it's hockey. Uh, there, there's a few differences with, uh, with blind hockey. Uh, number one being the puck is metal with metal bearings inside of it. It's a big puck with a big metal one, 
and uh, it has metal bearings in it, so it, it makes it ring. So all the players on the ice know uh, that the puck is about to drop. I mean, here in Newfoundland, it's uh, I mean, it's it's slowly growing. Uh, you know, we started the first year with two kids. You know, we move up to four or five. This year, we're looking to having uh, eight to ten kids on the ice every Sunday. Um, you know, for a day like today, we run this uh, we run this program uh, once a year. The, this is just the Learn to Skate program. We offer this. So today, you know, today we've got uh, about 25 uh, visually impaired children uh, here to learn to skate. Uh, you know, and, and uh, this is basically we get them out on the ice today. Hopefully, you know, we can get these kids to be more interested and maybe they come out every Sunday with us in our program. Well, it's not Santa's normal sleigh, but it did arrive here in Happy Valley Goose Bay holding some very precious cargo for some kids on the North Coast. I'll tell you what's on board that Hercules coming up on Here Now. It's Christmas time in St. John's. You're coming to the mall to get your Christmas gifts. Why not give a gift to the whole community? CBC's Feed at L Day is Thursday, December 12th. We'll have live music from Damien Follett and other great artists. CBC personalities will be here to wrap your Christmas gifts. And best of all, we're raising funds for your local food bank. Make sure no one in this province goes hungry this Christmas. And on Thursday, December 12th, we'll make sure everyone at the Avalon Mall stays merry.
Hope to see you next week at the mall. Now, Christmas is still a couple of weeks off, but the big job of getting gifts up the north coast of Labrador is already underway. A military aircraft landed at the Goose Bay Airport today carrying some very precious cargo, and our Jacob Barker went to check it out. This isn't Santa's usual sleigh, but he's making sure it arrives safe and sound. Let's call it Santa's support aircraft. Well, we can't call it Force One, but we'll call it Force Two. He's there to greet the crew from Trenton, Ontario. We gotta go walk around the blades though. And one little guy even gets to hang with the big guy. Whoa, boxes and boxes of toys, eh? Isn't that cool? The pallets come off one by one, destined for Labrador's north coast. A big effort, a team effort. I mean, Send is here, the RCMP is here in Red Surge, the Canadian Forces. How often do you get to see all of those organizations together? And uh, I mean, I mean, this is such a great cause, right? Uh, helping out the, uh, the communities on the North Coast, the children that don't have the same opportunities as, uh, as many of us do, uh, and getting them some, uh, some toys and some cheer for Christmas. About a thousand toys in all collected, donations from RCMP detachments in Ontario and the Canadian Toy Association from here, they get sorted and packed and sent to the remote communities. I think it's great to be able to help with the community and help with kids in that. It's, uh, it, put, it puts us out there in a good light to be able to help people out, right? It's part of our job. We do that every day, right? Santa does a lot, but he can't do it all on his own. He appreciates the help he's getting. Oh, they're amazing. They come together uh, yearly on this event, uh, and they come together early to make sure that it's well organized, that we have the right people here making sure that the gifts are wrapped before they go up uh, up to the northern community. So this is, uh, this is amazing. This is one of the best events of the year. High praise from the big guy for a big operation full of big hearts. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. That's quite something. A little more thrust than a sled with a few reindeer, right? <laughs> Just the way, you never know. <laughs> it was Christmassy there, but it's been looking Christmassy in Labrador for a while. Now, it compared certainly to the has. Avalon, yeah. yeah, the Avalon has been uh, a little green. <laughs> yeah, gray. <laughs> a little gray. Yeah, we do have uh, potentially some snow on the way, though, so okay. we'll, we'll get to that forecast. But let's take a look at the uh, temperatures that we saw today. Much cooler. Uh, for the Avalon only reached a high near two degrees in St. John's, but pretty similar temperatures across the board for the island anyway, up through Labrador, much cooler, 12, minus 12 in Lab City today. And then Happy Valley Goose Bay, as you saw, snowy, but uh, sitting around minus three as your afternoon high. So actually not too bad uh, through the day. Here's a look at the current satellite and radar. We do have some activity happening along the west coast and then same for eastern Newfoundland. Things on the west coast are going to get a little bit uh, more snowy as we head through the night tonight. We can thank some onshore snow for that. Some squalls potentially. The setup's pretty good tonight. You see some heavy snow up through portions uh, of around Gross Morn and then part portions of the northern peninsula as well. Otherwise, we're just looking at actually some partially cloudy skies tonight and then that risk of some flurries along the south coast and then same for the Avalon towards the surface though that will more than likely fall as rain through the overnight tonight. Now here's that snow squall watch as I mentioned good 10 to 15 centimeters is possible even upwards of 20 centimeters by the time Saturday rolls around uh, Saturday night rolls around but here's a look at your overnight temperatures tonight westerlies so picking up gusts uh, between 30 to 50 kilometers per hour for parts of the Avalon going down to about minus one is the overnight low tonight for St. John's minus five for Grand Falls Windsor Best chance we'll see partly cloudy skies there. Same for uh, St. Anthony with a few flurries, possible minus three, and Port Basque sitting around minus two. Up through Labrador, your temperature is going to drop quite dramatically tonight. Minus 17 for Lab City and uh, wind chills feeling closer to the minus 20s with uh, flurries or light snow continuing right through Lab West into uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay sitting around minus 10 tonight. So tomorrow we're going to see a quick system move through mainly for Eastern Newfoundland and the Avalon. Here it is there going to start as snow more than likely for Eastern Newfoundland, even parts of the Avalon as well. But as the afternoon rolls around, probably a noon start as the afternoon rolls around those temperatures more than likely going to see some rain and snow mixture and then go back to snow as we head into the evening hours, just as that low pulls away and we get some of that colder air wrapped around. But again, hanging on to that snow squall setup along the west coast and then things start to ramp up for coastal Labrador. You're looking at uh, winter snow, uh, winter storm watches rather up through parts of uh, Makovic and Hopedale where you're going to see quite a bit of snow. So this is through to Saturday morning. So there's that 10 to 15 that we've been talking about for the past couple of days. 
and then uh, the snow as far as the Avalon goes showing somewhere between 5 to 10 centimeters but with some of that rain mixed in in those lower elevations uh, amounts won't be nearly that high but it'll happen quite quickly. So here's your temperature sitting around 2 degrees for St. John's. Southwesterly is 20 to 40 kilometers per hour as you head towards eastern Newfoundland. Uh, you're looking at uh, 0 to 1 degree and then even more so uh, cooler as we head towards Grand Falls, Windsor. Gander area likely between 2 to 4 centimeters at the most. Majority of the snow will be on along uh, the mountainous areas. Like I said, gross more in 10 to 15 centimeters. Otherwise, you're looking at about 5 centimeters of snow. And then for Cartwright, minus 4 tomorrow. And then that snow for Makovic, uh, anywhere from 20 to about 40 centimeters of snow is possible by the time Sunday rolls around. So that's a quick look at your Saturday forecast. I'll have the rest of the forecast for the weekend coming up. Today, if we hadn't been watching, you know, uh, ourselves in the NDP, uh, this could have slipped through. Now, did he make a rogue decision? We're thinking so. Well, coming up, these MHAs explain the story behind one Liberal who did not vote to punish Christopher Mitchell-Moore last night and just what brought them to their feet. That's coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, to the political story of the week, there was one liberal last night who did not vote to punish Christopher Mitchell Moore, and that was the minister himself. Um, are you going to have anything to say today at all? You have nothing to say? A week of fleeing from questions. And then standing up to say the premier never directed his actions, and then remaining seated, as you see there, while his colleagues voted to punish him and force him to apologize for gross misconduct. Mitchell Moore's decision to vote against punishment took many liberals by surprise and the opposition members. So I called Mitchell Moore's office seeking an explanation today as to why he voted the way he did. Still waiting. The premier has been saying all week that the disgraced minister would apologize. But did Mitchell Moore have permission to break rank last night or did he simply go rogue? Well, I met up with two opposition MHAs today for their thoughts on Mitchell Moore's actions. Yeah, so we, we noticed that uh, that uh, Minister Mitchell Moore didn't stand up for uh, for the uh, final motion on uh, on his uh, on his uh, punishment there for uh, for that. So uh, we noticed, uh, I noticed, and I let um, our Mr. Din know, our uh, House Leader, and then they sig he signaled over to the uh, to the PCs, and uh, so they also uh, were aware of it. I stood up, uh, and uh, as well as one of their members stood up, so that way we could uh, make sure that the motion did get through and pass, so that there would be a uh, a punishment for uh, what was uh, what was on the report. All right, so some Tories, or at least one Tory and one New Democrat voted. Mr. Brazel, what, what happened? What's your take of what happened last night? Well, you know, Mr. Mitchell Moore uh, took the opportunity to sit down, hoping that the motion would be defeated, and then he would have no restitution for uh, the mismanagement of this file. So when it was noted between, you know, Mr. Forsey uh, and uh, Jordan, we managed to be able to get to a point where we would get the vote. You know, at the end of the day, it wasn't where we wanted to go, but it's ironic that Mr. Mitchell Moore voted for the amendments, and then wouldn't vote for the main motion that was amended to do the same thing. So in essence, he voted against the, the motion that would have seen him get punished. How close did we come to there being no punishment for Mr. Mitchell Moore at all? Very close. At the end of the day, if we hadn't been watching, you know, uh, ourselves in the NDP, uh, this could have slipped through. Now, did he make a rogue decision? We're thinking so because it, you know, the motion was put forward by the Liberals to amend, to lessen what we had put forward uh, from ourselves in the NDP. Uh, if this had gone through, he would have had actually no punishment whatsoever. So uh, because you know, both of us managed to get a member up to vote for it, at the end of the day, he's still punished. Not to where we want it to go, but there is a severe punishment. Okay, what's your sense of this? Because the Premier said, uh, you know, Mitchell Moore's going to apologize, almost a suggestion that, you know, that there's a little bit of contrition a sense that you know maybe he feels that you know I actually do want to apologize fully what do you make of the fact that he didn't want to have the punishment that the house seemed to want, his own party wanted yeah it, it seems interesting that way but uh, it, they did they did vote along with everything as we said we'd, uh, we we uh, we didn't really want to go along with the lesser of uh, what was put forward um, but right now like I said we we had to make sure that something was carried through right so if he's apologetic about everything that happened what does it say that he didn't want to vote for the punishment in the end well, that, be that becomes the issue here, but all through this debate, he's never once admitted he had done anything wrong. He never once took any responsibility for the outcome and what had happened at the hiring in the rooms itself. He never once acknowledged the fact that he should have done things differently. And that became the issue here. So at the end of the day, when you vote for an amendment that is going to punish you and acknowledge that you did done something wrong, and then you vote against that, then it says uh, to me it's the arrogance that he still thinks he's done nothing wrong and he was allowed to do what he wanted or he was instructed to do it and he's covering for somebody else. Mr. Brazel, Mr. Brown, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, another person not completely happy with last night's end result is Chess Crosby. The leader of the Progressive Conservatives met with reporters late last evening after the Mitchell-Moore apology. Distressing to see that the member, Mr. Mitchell-Moore, uh, voted against his own punishment and defied his own caucus and voted against what the Premier and everyone else around him were voting for. In other words, what has he learned out of this? It's, uh, I can't see that Mitchell Moore has taken a lesson from this. He made a mistake. Okay, we all make mistakes, but you've got to take the lesson from that and learn from it. He hasn't learned anything, and that's why the higher punishment, which involved restitution, was more appropriate. Now, he voted against the punishment, but so did you. Why did almost all of your caucus decide not to vote in favor of that list of punishments, which contain almost all of the things that you were looking for? It's because we thought that, particularly in view of the fact that Mr. Mitchell Moore was refusing to leave the cabinet and Mr. Ball was refusing to put him out of cabinet, 
it was appropriate to ensure that he didn't receive the benefit of a cabinet minister's salary. He'd get his underlying MHA's pay, but not the cabinet minister's pay. And that was appropriate restitution to the government for the money that he threw away in making the manipulations that he made to get Carla Foote her job. So we were against the lower level of punishment, and that's why we voted against it. What do you think, he stood up and apologized, what do you think he was apologizing for? I think he's just going through the motions, frankly, if you want my opinion. Everyone in there in that house knows what happened. The Premier's chief of staff or other high official made a suggestion or gave a direction, it doesn't matter because when it comes from the Premier, a suggestion is a direction, as to what Mr. Mitchell Moore ought to do to arrange for the job, contrary to the Merrick principle. And everyone in that house knows what happened, everyone. Paul Lane explained it, many of us explained it. There's nobody who would dissent from that. It was a manipulation to get a political friend a job contrary to the merit principle. Two commissioners, officials of the House of Assembly, found that it was gross mismanagement, costing provincial taxpayers a pile of money, and Mr. Mitchell Moore voted against his own punishment. Um, personally, I feel a warm meal is being able to um, stay together with family and share a very delicious meal on a Christmas day. The food bank does a really important job, especially in the holidays. A warm meal means comfort. Uh, to me, it means community. It means a lot to me that I have the uh, capacity to have a nice warm meal. A warm meal can warm more than one cup. Now to a story that's almost the opposite of charity. Certainly it is the season for giving, but the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre is warning of scammers who are only out there for the taking. And tonight on our CBC Investigate series about consumer news you can use, here now's Jen White gives us the lowdown on scams to watch out for at this time of year. Ho, ho, hold on. That's the advice from the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre as consumers start gearing up for the season. Take five minutes to stop and think and go with your gut. Here's the lowdown on holiday scams. The agency says when it comes to online shopping, consumers need to be vigilant. 
we know the, the scammers are creating fake ads that will direct people to websites that may offer counterfeit or uh, products that are inferior to uh, real to, to quality products. The Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre has some warning signs. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Check for spelling mistakes and bad grammar on the website, and search for warnings or reviews posted online before making a purchase. Thompson says consumers should also be wary when selling items online, especially when a potential buyer offers more than the asking price. They often claim to be uh, located abroad. They'll, they'll offer to buy a site unseen, you know, so they don't even need to see it. Uh, and, uh, and, they'll, and they'll send you a counterfeit check or a, a fraud payment or sending you sort of a spooked email that looks like you're receiving a PayPal or, or some sort of third-party transfer money into your account. The Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre says never send merchandise without confirming that a payment has been received. It's also a busy time of year for charities seeking donations. The agency says fraudsters try to cash in by using legitimate charity names to collect money. Before donating, you can check to see if a charity is registered by visiting the Canada Revenue Agency's website. Ultimately what we recommend with charities is that you try and donate locally. That way you know where your money's going, uh, you know who you're dealing with. Thompson says if you become a victim of fraud, it's important to report it to police and then alert the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre with as much detail as possible. Reporting starts by you having a, a chronological statement of events uh, so that you can easily describe what's occurred and provide that information to law enforcement. To international news now, Swedish activist Greta Thunberg continued her Friday call for action against climate change, this time in Madrid on the sidelines of UN-sponsored climate talks. The hope is not within the walls of the COP25. The hope is out here with you. Now, before her dress, Thunberg took part in a massive protest march, but she had to pull out early due to what she calls a safety concern, and that concern, a swarm of media and supporters trying to get close to her. Organizers say about 500,000 people attended the march. Well, delegates at the two-week COP25 are trying to reach an agreement on emissions trading. Thunberg will speak to the conference next week. Well, keeping with climate, a wine company in London is turning the traditional wine bottle on its head. Garçon Wines has squished it. The bottle still holds the same amount of wine, but it's lighter and stackable. And that means it's more efficient transportation and less CO2 emissions. Let's take a look. We make a flat wine bottle to save space. 40% spatially smaller as a result of the, of the shape innovation. But we also make the bottle in a 100% in recycled PET. That's pre-existing material, not single-use plastic. We do that to save weight. We also do that to use a sustainable material source which is light, strong and looks like glass, a product we know and like. We're developing packaging for Greta Thunberg's generation. We're not generating packaging or creating packaging uh, for, for an older generation there. I said, because that is the future. When children and, and school children are going out striking for, for, for climate crisis, we need to recognize that um, post-2020, post-2025, nobody's going to drink wine from a heavy spatially efficient bottle which has a grotesque and unnecessary carbon footprint. By using a PET bottle over a glass bottle, we save somewhere in the region of 77% lower greenhouse gas emissions. That's significant. You'd need to use a glass bottle 20 times for it to have the same carbon footprint or environmental cost. Many industries need to wake up because we're living in a different era and too many people are living in the 20th century when we're in the 21st century. And wine is a great example because we're still using 19th century packaging.
Welcome back. We're going to look deep into the weekend. Uh, some people haven't yet put their Christmas decorations up. Nope. <laughs> Is this going to be the I'm kind of weekend to where, where you're going to want to? Uh, yep. Okay. Yeah, especially if we see some snow tomorrow. Right. Uh, it'll feel a little Christmassy, but uh, the end of the weekend's looking a little better if right. you're planning on doing that, albeit a little bit cold. So let's take a look at uh, what we're expecting weather-wise. It should calm down for most of us on the island, except along the west coast, where we'll more than likely continue to see that potential for some snow squalls, and uh, maybe even a few down around the south coast as well through the afternoon on Sunday. Some clearing skies up through Labrador as well. And then the next system will bring in some cloud cover for areas uh, in Lab West, bringing some snow. And then that's going to move towards the West Coast into uh, Monday morning. So here's a look at uh, temperatures for Sunday. So cooler, minus three, but plenty of sunshine. It looks like for most of the Avalon as we head towards Central as well. Gander, Grand Falls, Windsor. Both in those minus single digits, but plenty of sunshine. Uh, Going to continue to see some flurry activity and or some snow squalls at times along the west coast. And then Happy Valley Goose Bay temperatures will drop down to the minus single digits, uh, minus double digits rather. Same for name and then Lab City as well. But uh, again, looking at that potential for a few flurries. Looking ahead into Monday uh, morning, there's that snow that I just showed you a little bit earlier and uh, potentially along the south coast as well mainly cloudy skies for the rest of us and then up through uh, Labrador again going to see a little bit of clearing then that big push of warm air is moving in and again still looking like double digit temperatures for most areas uh, on the island potentially uh, seeing some heavy rain as well with some windy conditions and then even making it as far north as Labrador potentially seeing some of, uh, mixing certainly potential for some freezing rain maybe uh, some ice pellets Again, still have a few days to iron that forecast out, but it is looking like this one will stick around mainly along the island uh, with that uh, rain potential into Wednesday, some warmer temperatures, and then they're going to drop like a rock overnight. And you can see as that cold front pushes through some cooler air moving in and everything changes over to snow. So uh, and then into Tuesday going to continue with that potential for some snow. So here's a look at the temperatures. Note those double digits by Tuesday with uh, rain and windy conditions. Uh, and then Monday, before we get to that, it's still going to stay in those single digits. But we are on the rise. Overnight low Tuesday night, 13 degrees potentially. And then dropping like a rock into Wednesday night. Those uh, temperatures for central Newfoundland uh, going to stay pretty much in the uh, minus 2 to minus 9 degree range as we head through the weekend. And then that push of warm air will move in Tuesday, looking at about 8 degrees as of now. Might reach the double digits, but leaving it there uh, as the forecast stands right now. And then for western Newfoundland, generally gray, unfortunately, as those temperatures start to climb into the middle of next week. And then for eastern Labrador, sunshine on Mon uh, Sunday, rather, and then dipping down by the time Wednesday rolls around into the minus double digits. And then for Western Labrador, back down to the minus 20s by the time Tuesday and then your daytime high on Wednesday, only reaching the dub, uh, minus double digits as well. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Well, if you're a streel or crooked as sin, there's a clothing company in this province that has your back. Caitlin Noseworthy runs Saltwater Designs and puts local sayings on clothing. And tonight we're shining the spotlight on local designers with the first of a series of three profiles from video producer Leon Morrison. All this just in time for the Christmas holiday shopping season. So I've always loved Newfoundland. I actually grew up in Alberta, but I have roots here. Um, my dad is actually from St. John's, and I've always loved visiting. I love how beautiful it is here. Obviously not the weather, <laughs> but, um, and the people are so friendly, as a lot of people who have visited Newfoundland will say. Um, and I always felt like I wanted to establish roots here. I made the move out here alone, and um, I left you know everything I knew in Alberta, my parents, everything, my friends. I chose to do Newfoundland sayings mostly because I heard so many of them growing up as a child. My dad would say a lot of these sayings and I just thought they were hilarious. None of my friends knew what he was talking about. 
and um, so I decided to put streel on a shirt one day because when I heard that saying, I was like, streel, that's me. Like, I'm a hot mess. I need to put that on a shirt. And then, you know, all my friends and mom friends were like, oh, that's great. I'd love to have one of those too. That's hilarious. We can just be streel together. And then people started asking for other sayings, like, could you put saucy or crooked as sin or only nerves on a shirt? And I was like, sure, why not? And then, you know, it just kind of grew from there. I just love how people can, you know, relate and find humor in the sayings on my shirts and people just love being able to talk about, you know, where they come from and their roots and it just sparks a conversation kind of wherever they go. You know, in Newfoundland, people are like, where did you get that shirt? I need a shirt that says that. And when they go on trips, um, you know, they get to explain to people who have no idea what that means, what it means. And, you know, I think Newfoundlanders love doing that because they're so proud of where they come from. Language is so important in Newfoundland because it kind of provides that uniqueness from the rest of Canada. Um, Newfoundlanders are such proud people and, you know, they love where they come from and language just kind of cements that pride. All right, well, since that piece was recorded, Noseworthy has opened a new shop on Topsail Road in St. John's. Well, I want to know where you're to. Take wow. a look at this gorgeous winter scene. We're setting in there, aren't we? Christmas is getting here. It is. I'll tell you where this is too when we come back.
Let's see who's celebrating anniversaries and birthdays. Happy 99th birthday to Vera Pickett. Her big day was on Wednesday. And on Monday, Kay McCann in Stephenville celebrated her 91st birthday. Yesterday, it was a happy 98th birthday for Ignatia Madden in Grand Falls, Windsor. And happy birthday last week to Queenie Florence George, who turned 93. Happy 90th birthday today to Joyce Reed in Cornerbrook. Happy 50th anniversary to Tom and Ruby Brown, and happy 57th wedding anniversary yesterday to Margaret and Eric Diamond in Pooch Cove. Happy 58th anniversary to Cornelius and Patsy Bennett in Rushoon, and Scott and Mildred Daw from Fogo Island celebrated 67 years together this past Tuesday. And also on Tuesday, Melvin and Rumi Comden celebrated 55 years together. And a happy 55th anniversary to Florence and Stedman Clark in Springdale. And a happy 56th anniversary yesterday to Rhoda and Garland Parsons in Norris Point. Happy 96th birthday today to Maud Stoyles from Grand Bay. And a happy 93rd birthday to Dorman Alexander in Flat Bay. On Tuesday, Muriel Pickett from Centerville celebrated her 95th birthday. On Sunday, Gertie Butler of Seal Cove CBS will celebrate her 90th birthday. And today, Lowell and Pamela Bonnell are celebrating 50 years together. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Fred and Marjorie Wilkins in Gambo. And on Wednesday, it was a 62nd anniversary for Howard and Marion Decker in Clarenville. Congrats Nathan and Violet Yetman in Bay Roberts, who will celebrate 71 years together tomorrow. And a happy 90th birthday to Elizabeth Lizzie Dobbin from Little Bay, Green Bay. And tomorrow, Ruth Hiscock celebrates her 91st birthday in beautiful Eastport. Happy birthday to Bill Clark from New Perlican, now living in Carboneer. And happy birthday to Pearl Noseworthy, who is the oldest resident, most mature, in leading tickles. Pearl turns 96 on Sunday. Yesterday, Don Bursey celebrated his 91st birthday. Don's from Buckins, now lives in Grand Falls, Windsor. And on Monday, Clifton Loader from Summerside, Bay of Islands, celebrated his 93rd birthday. Also Monday, a big day for Ruby Hiscock in Mount Pearl, who will celebrate her 101st birthday. Apparently, she bets with her son Paul on Scrabble Games, a woman after my own heart. Happy 58th anniversary to Clyde and Georgina Thomas and Lanza Claire. And Norm and Olive Oldford from Eastport celebrated their 55th wedding anniversary on Wednesday. Happy 54th wedding anniversary to Max and Ina Loveless of Seal Cove Fortune Bay. And Edgar and Florence Pink from Gander will celebrate 60 years together. Happy 92nd birthday tomorrow to William Dwyer in Carboneer. Happy birthday to Hazel Elliott of Botwood who is celebrating her 96th birthday today. And a happy 97th birthday to Mary Lockyer of Garden Cove Placentia Bay. And Gordon Parsons from the Codroy Valley, who celebrated his 94th birthday on Sunday, December 2nd. That's awesome. And yeah. we did forget a birthday, though. Yes, yes, Paul Pickett. And he's the guy who puts all the um, happy birthdays and anniversaries together. He's 94. <laughs> oh, no, sorry, 49. It's a <laughs> dyslexia thing. Yeah. Uh, so. Happy birthday. That. Yeah, well done, Paul. And mm -hmm. thanks for your patience with us down here in the <laughs> studio. Picture? Picture. Let's take Let's a look take at this look. beautiful photo. Isn't that a great shot? Is, is that on the island? It is. Oh, phew. At least yeah. I got it half right. <laughs> it's in Millertown. Nice spot, too. It is. Beautiful spot there. Thank you so much to uh, Nelson, Anthony, for sending that great uh, shot in. And if you have any yeah. you'd like to share with us over the weekend, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Please do. I hope you have a great weekend. A lot of Christmas plans. you got any plans? I'm going to get my Christmas tree. Okay. I think I'm going to go to Caitlin's store and get... Uh, I have a few sooks on my Christmas list. So I'll them. <laughs> Perfect. Wouldn't mind one of those saucy shirts for, for me, actually. But anyhow, <laughs> have a great idea. weekend. We'll see you on Monday. <laughs> Good night.